Okay, this should be working. If it's not, then we'll re. Okay. Picking up with chapter 30, the pencils. Sorry, this is going to bounce around a bit because it's got to sit on my lap. Um, Chapter 30 begins on page 581. <clears throat> and I want to start with um, Actually, pages 582, 583. So here he goes up to Dumbledore's office um, after, hold on just a second. after his dream and he sees Dumbledore, um, Fudge and Moody and they've got to go down and uh, inspect the grounds and on page 583. Now Harry's been obviously has been in um, Dumbledore's office before And he sees Fox, he sees Gryffindor's sword. And we're told on the middle of 583. This time he sees something he hasn't seen before. A shallow stone basin lay there with odd carvings around the edge, runes and symbols Harry did not recognize. Silvery light coming from the basin's contents, which were like nothing Harry had ever seen before, okay? So, he goes closer to it, and we're told, bottom of 583, he wanted to touch it to find out what it felt like. But nearly four years' experience in the magical world told him that sticking his hand into a bowl uh, full of some unknown substance was a very stupid thing to do. So he pulled out his wand and, you know, prods the material in the basin and it kind of swirls around harry looks you know closer and he keeps looking at it and he sees through the surface of this hazy smoky material an enormous room this is the top of page 584 an enormous room below the surface of the mysterious substance, a room into which he seemed to be looking through a circular window in the ceiling. Room's dimly lit, right? But it kind of looks like it could be one like in Hogwarts because it's got, you know, torches on the brackets and brackets on the walls and stuff. So he lowers his face closer and closer until his nose is an inch away from whatever that substance is. He sees wizards on either side of the room, okay? There's a, a lower space and then there's like stairs going up and there's wizards seated. I mean, th think like um, stadium bleachers and there's wizards seated in these, okay? The basin being circular, page 584, in the room he was observing square, Harry could not make out what was going on in the corners of it. So he leans even closer because he's trying, you know, think of, think of my phone here, it's the thing. He leans closer because he's trying to see what's going on 
in these corners until he touches his nose to the surface. Dumbledore's office gave an almighty lurch. Harry was thrown forward and pitched headfirst into the substance inside the basin. And he finds himself in this room, seated in one of the seats, looks around him. There's a couple hundred wizards and witches in there. Nobody seems to notice him. And he's seated right next to Dumbledore. He starts talking to him, but Dumbledore doesn't take any notice of him. Right. And we're told, bottom of 585, once before, Harry had found himself somewhere that nobody could see or hear him. That time, he'd fallen into, through a page in an enchanted diary, right into somebody else's memory. And Harry thinks something similar had happened here. In other words, he is in somebody's memory. He waves his right hand in front of Dumbledore. Dumbledore doesn't see him. Okay. So he keeps watching. And he sees Igor Karkaroff brought in. Okay. Headmaster of Durmstrang. But he's a younger Igor Karkaroff than Harry has seen during the Triwizard Tournament. Okay. So we find out this is a trial. This is a hearing. Karkaroff says he wants to help, 587. Right. Harry sees Moody, 588. Again, a younger, uh, less disfigured Moody. Right. Moody says, you know, Karkaroff is gonna, is gonna get out. Crouch has made a deal with him, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so Karkaroff starts naming names, page 589. Anton and Dolov. Kraut says we already have them. Uh, Roju. Okay. Roju's dead. Uh, Karkaroff, you know, kind of looks around. Crouch, any more names? Uh, Karkaroff says, yes, Travers. He helped murder the McKinnons, Mulsiper. Okay. Rookwood. There's a name that Crouch kind of is startled at. Augustus Rookwood? Very same. Travis and Mulsper we have, Rookwood, eh, we didn't know about, okay? And then Karkaroff mentions Snape. And Kraut says, 590, Snape has been cleared by this council. He has been vouched for by Albus Dumbledore. No, I assure you, Snape is a Death Eater. And Dumbledore stands up. I've given evidence already on this matter. Severus Snape was indeed a death eater was past tense, indeed indicating this is a fact. Okay. However, he rejoined our side before Lord Voldemort's downfall and turned spy for us at great personal risk. He is now no more a death eater than I am. Why is it important that he rejoined before Voldemort's downfall and not after? Well. Go back to the Quidditch World Cup. We see the Death Eaters going off, you know, torturing um, the Roberts family and such. And we hear, I think it is Bill, talk about how <coughs> all the Death Eaters who haven't been put in Azkaban um, are free because they said, they never intended to be Death Eaters. They were under Imperius curses, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So what this is telling us is Snape turned against Voldemort while Voldemort was still at the height of his powers. That's how we know Snape was serious, right? All these other Death Eaters, Quidditch World Cup, they turned against Voldemort after he'd already disappeared. In other words, there was no danger to them in doing so. When Snape turned against Voldemort, there was great danger. After all, what does Voldemort seemingly um, often say, and we'll, we'll hear him say it at the end of this book, 
He says, don't lie to Lord Voldemort. He always knows. He says that at the beginning of his book too, right? So, Dumbledore vouches for Snape, right? Dungeon goes black, comes back, Ludo Bagman's brought in. Harry hears charges against Ludo Bagman. Ludo Bagman is found essentially innocent by this group. Why? It's apparently because he's a famous sports star, right? So Crouch calls for a vote. Bagman says, I never did anything intentionally. I talked with Rookwood. He was going to get me a job in the ministry. You know, he is friends with my father, blah, blah, blah. Okay. One of the witches, you know, thanks Bagman for his splendid performance for England in the Quidditch match against Turkey. In other words, he gets off scot-free <coughs> because, <coughs> because he's a famous athlete. Okay. Crouch is, you know, disgusted at that. Goes dark again, comes back light. The new group is brought in. Page 594. Four individuals. They're brought in and they're chained to their seats. And we're told there's a thick set man who stared blankly up at Crouch, a thinner and more nervous looking man whose eyes are darting around the room, a woman with thick, shiny, dark hair, heavily hooded eyes, who sits in the chair as though it were a throne, and a boy in his late teens who looked petrified. Right? Crouch stands up, tells them what they're accused of, and we're told 595. The four of you stand accused of capturing an Auror, Frank Longbottom, and subjecting him to the subjecting him to the Cruciatus curse, believing him to have knowledge of the present whereabouts of your exiled master. So this is after Voldemort's downfall. This is after Voldemort tries to curse Harry, disappears, etc. And the young boy, the white freckled faced boy, says, Father, I didn't, I didn't, I swear it, Father, don't send me back. And Crouch, you know, just shouts over him, You are further accused, blah, blah, blah. The boy screams, Mother. Okay, so this is Crouch's son. He's appealing now to his mother. Crouch says, raise your hands if you agree they deserve a life sentence. And everybody does. Okay. 596. The boy screams as they're being let out. I'm your son. I'm your son. Crouch, you are no son of mine. I have no son. So he disowns him. Okay. Go back to the beginning of the novel when the black mark is seen at the Quidditch World Cup. And we have Amos kind of insinuate that Barty Crouch Sr. has taught his house elf Winky how to conjure the dark mark. And what did Barty Crouch say? He said, you know, he says, I assume you know, you know, the history, essentially, um, of my deeds against the dark arts. Okay. This is what he's referring to. He's not only referring to, you know, throwing other people in jail. He's talking about putting his own son in Azkaban, right? And Dumbledore taps Harry on the shoulder and says, time to return to my office. So he lifts Harry up. Harry apologizes, 597. And I shouldn't have, I didn't mean to. Cabinet door is open. Dumbledore, quite understand. 14, curious. So Harry asks, what is this? Dumbledore, it's a pensive, right? Notice Rowling's kind of play on words. French, pense, P-E-N-S-E-E-S, okay, for plural means thoughts. P-E-N-S is the root word. So like if you are pensive, P-E-N-S-I-V-E, -E, it means you're in a kind of a recollect, 
interesting meditative frame of mind. You are, you are thinking of important things, right? This is a pensive thought, S-I-E-V-E, -E, like you do if, you know, you, you boil noodles. And what do you do? You have to strain them. So you, one thing you may use is a sieve. You pour the noodles and the water through the sieve. The water goes through. It leaves the noodles. So this is a tool, a technology, if you want to call it that for sifting your thoughts, right? So Dumbledore says, sometimes I know you have the feeling I have too many thoughts and memories crammed into my mind. He says, so I use the pencil. One simply siphons off the excess thoughts from my mind, pours them into the basin and examines them at one's leisure. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, literally. You guys, you know, you're coming to the end of the semester, you've got a bunch of exams and you, you've got all the stuff going on. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to pull off all the thoughts dealing with, you know, exams X and Y so that you can focus on exam Z. So you put those aside, you take exam Z and then you, you know, put the thoughts back in. Okay. Harry, that's your thoughts? Dumbledore, yes. And so he pulls out his wand and he pulls a thought out. Page 598. And he sees Snape's face. And Snape says, it's coming back. Carcross too, stronger, clearer than ever. Dumbledore, connection I could have made without assistance, but never mind. He looks at Harry. He swirls the stuff and, Harry, and he tells Harry, I was using the pensive when Mr. Fudge arrived, okay? I put it away. I didn't fasten the door properly, you know. Harry apologizes and Dumbledore says, curiosity is not a sin, but we should exercise caution with our curiosity. In other words, it's okay to be curious, Harry, but you know, be wary about what you investigate. So it's a little bit of advice for something, you know, things that might come up later. So they sit there, they keep talking. He pulls out another memory. And there's Bertha Jorkins, who we've heard is missing, right? Harry talks about being in divination, falling asleep. Dumbledore says, understandable, okay? Talked about his dream. The dream had Wormtail. The dream had Voldemort. Okay. Voldemort did the Cruciatus on Wormtail. It woke up Harry. <coughs> so he asked Dumbledore, bottom of 600, you know why my scar is hurting? And Dumbledore says, I've got a theory. Your scar hurts you both when Voldemort is near you and when he's feeling hatred, really strong hatred. Okay? He says, you're, you're connected by that scar. So Harry says, so you, you think <coughs> Voldemort performing the Cruciatus really happened? Possible, probable. How did you see Voldemort? Uh, back in this chair, okay. And then he asks, how could he hold the wand? Dumbledore, how indeed, how indeed. Well, it takes us back to the beginning of the book. Voldemort sitting in a chair, he's holding a wand, and Cruciatus is Frank Bryce, how's he holding the wand? So Harry asks, do you think he's getting stronger? He says, you know, Harry, here's my suspicions. When Voldemort was gaining power before, people started going missing. And he says, Bertha Jerkins has gone missing. Mr. Crouch has gone missing. There's a third disappearance. Ministry of Magic doesn't care about it. Why? Who went missing at the beginning of the novel? Frank Bryce. He's a muggle. Ministry of Magic doesn't care about muggles, right? 
Dumbledore says, top of the next page, these disappearances are linked. Here he asks another question. Ask you another question about that court thing? Dumbledore says, yes. He says, um, Crouch's son, were they talking about Neville's parents? Notice Dumbledore responds with a question. Has Neville never told you why he has been brought up by his grandmother? Harry doesn't even verbalize it. He just shakes his head no. He says, yes, they were talking about Neville's parents. His father, Frank, was an or just like Professor Moody. He and his wife were tortured for information, just as you heard. Harry assumes that means they're dead. No, says Dumbledore. They are insane, top of 603. They are both in St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies. I believe Neville visits him with his grandmother during the holidays. They do not recognize him. Talks about how they were popular. You know, the attacks came after Voldemort's fall from power. They caused a wave of fury. Ministry was under great pressure to catch those who had done it. <coughs> Longbottoms couldn't give evidence, you know. Harry says, so Crouch's son might not have been involved? Dumbledore, no idea. He asks about Bagman. He says he's never been accused of any dark magic stuff. And then Harry goes, you know, kind of for the kill. What about Snape? What, 604, what made you think he'd really stopped supporting Voldemort? And Dumbledore says, that's between Snape and myself. I'm not going to answer that question, Harry. Third task, right? So, 607. We're told Harry feels anger towards Party Crouch Jr. for what happened to Neville's parents, because he's thinking of Neville. Okay. Also helps explain, go back to the Unforgivable Curses chapter, where we see Mad-Eye Moody do the unfor Unforgivable Curses, and he does a Cruciatus Curse on a spider. And what do we see Neville doing? He's holding onto the desk in front of him until his knuckles are white. And Hermione says, stop. And that's when Moody says, you'll be Longbottom. And he takes him aside to, you know, help him afterwards, right? So why does Neville do that? The implication is, once we find out about the Cruciatus curse that was used on Neville's parents, is that Neville, like Harry with his parents, might have witnessed this. And deep in his subconscious, no. When he sees the, the spider being tortured, his subconscious kind of relives what happened to his parents, right? Um, 609, Harry knows, you know, he's got a maze to get through. He gets a letter from Sirius, says, let's concentrate on that. 611 and following, there's a new Rita Skeeter article. Uh, about Harry being disturbed and dangerous, how he has these, you know, fainting spells and such, how he can speak parcel tongue. Um, Harry mentions, you know, 613, Hermione's supposed to be figuring out magical bugging and such. He mentions it to Hermione and she goes, wait a second, Got an idea, and she runs off to the library. Okay, they have the weighing of the wands, kind of a thing. Uh, sorry, not the weighing of the wands. They have a surprise meeting with parents of the champions, and six fifteen, the Weasley show up. Okay, since Harry doesn't have his own parents there. Um, let's see here. Third task. So they go in, and let's see here. Okay, 
pages 620, 621. So Harry and, Ded uh, Harry and Cedric are tied for first place. They each have 85 points. So they'll go in the, they'll go in the maze at the same time, right? Second place with 80 points is Victor Crumb. He goes in afterwards, and then Fleur goes in, okay? So we're going to skip a bunch of the, the Megs. Harry sees Victor Crumb um, try to use a spell on somebody else. He stupefies him. They hear Fleur scream. And let's pick up with 630, 631. 630, no, let's pick up with um, 632. So you have Harry and Cedric at the, the end of the quarter that they're in, in the um, maze, you can, See the Triwizard Cup, okay? And Harry uses Expelliarmus to get away from the spider. The spider's already bit him and such. Cedric is closer to the cup than Harry is. And 632, we're told. Harry's leaning against the hedge, gasping for breath, looking around. Cedric is standing mere feet from the Triwizard Cup. And Harry says, take it. Go on, take it. You're there. But Cedric doesn't move. He nearly stood there looking at Harry. And then he turns around and looks at the cup. And Cedric says, you should take it. That's twice you should save my neck. In here. First time was against Crumb. Second time against the spider. 633. Harry, that's not how it's supposed to work. So you notice what Cedric is saying. You take it. You should win. That is, you deserve to win. You've protected me twice, Cedric is saying. I wouldn't have gotten this far if it hadn't been for you. Harry, that's not how it's supposed to work. Supposed to means, you know, kind of like according to the rules of <coughs> the Triwizard Tournament, which is... You know, rules can be broke, can be broken, and whoever gets their first wins. Okay. Cedric is closest. He should get there first. Not should morally, should he's mere feet away. Okay. The one who reaches the cup first gets the points. That's you. I'm telling you, I'm not going to win any races on this leg. It's like it's like the cup is here, let's say, and Harry is here. And Cedric is here. Harry's saying, if it's a race, I'm not going to win. Right? Uh, I lost my place. Hedrick takes, Cedric takes a couple paces. Okay, the cup's over here again. Cedric's like here. Harry's like here. The spider's right around here. Cedric was here. And Cedric takes a couple steps closer to the spider. In other words, he's moving away from the cup. And he says, no, no, I'm not gonna take the cup. Harry, stop being noble. What's he mean calling Cedric noble? What is a mark what is the quality of Hufflepuffs? They are loyal, just, and true. They are not afraid of hard work. Okay. What are the qualities of Gryffindor? Bold, daring, brave, courageous. And I think loyalty is thrown in there too. Nothing about hard work, nothing about fairness or justness. 
okay? Stop being noble. But here he's saying is, Cedric, stop being who you are. Stop being just, fair. Take it, then we can get out of here. What do you mean, then we can get out of here? Then I can get my leg looked at. I can stop being in pain. Cedric <clears throat> says to Harry, you told me about the dragons. I would have gone down in the first test if you hadn't told me what was coming. Harry, I had help on that too. Right? Who helped Harry? Edward. You helped me with the egg. We're square. Cedric, I had help on the egg in the first place. Okay? Moody helped him. Harry, we're still square. In other words, okay, so we both received help from others. We're still even. Cedric, you should have got more points on the second task. You stayed behind to get all the hostages. I should have done that. Remember, second task, Harry was actually the first one there. <coughs> but he wouldn't leave with Ron until Cedric got Hermione, uh, excuse me, until Cedric got, um, what's her name, out of the way, and until Victor got Hermione out of the way. Okay. Notice, I should have done that. Harry, I was the only one who was thick enough to take that song seriously. That is, I was too stupid. Well, what did the song say? If you wait longer than an hour, you will forever give up the thing you treasure most. Harry didn't want to see Ron die. And yet they were told at the beginning of the Triwizard Tournament what would not be allowed to happen. No one would die this time around. Last time it was done, people could die. That's part of the game, part of the rules, you know, kind of like the Hunger Games meets Harry Potter. Harry, just take the cup. Notice he's exasperated because he's in pain. Cedric, no. He stepped over the spider's tangled legs to join Harry, who stared at him. Cedric was serious. He was walking away <coughs> from the sort of glory Hufflepuff hadn't had in centuries. Notice, he wasn't walking away from personal glory, Harry's thinking. He's walking away from the kind of glory Hufflepuff House had had. Cedric says, go on. So now he's, it's almost like he's farther away from the cup than Harry is. Harry looks at Cedric, he looks at the cup. He looks at Cedric, he looks at the cup. He sees himself, you know, in his mind's eye, emerging from the maze, holding the cup. He sees himself holding the Triwizard Cup. He hears the adulation and such. And then he looks at Cedric again and says, both of us, what? We'll take it at the same time. It's still a Hogwarts victory. We'll tie for it. Gryffindor and Hufflepuff will get equal glory. Cedric, you sure? Yeah, we've helped each other out, haven't we? We both got here, let's take it together. You're on. So one, two, three, they both reach for the cup and it's a port key. Chapter 32. Harry felt his feet slam into the ground. His leg gives way. He says, where are we? Cedric doesn't have an idea, right? And notice Cedric looks at Harry and says, did anyone tell you the cup was a porky? Nope. In other words, people are giving you inside information. Did anybody tell you? Nope, says Harry. Is this supposed to be part of the task? Cedric, don't know. Wands out? Yeah, said Harry. Glad that Cedric suggested it first. Why is he glad that Harry, that Cedric suggested it? Does it possibly show weakness? Show fear? I mean, sure it does. So they pull out the wands. We're told someone's coming. 
And they see this figure coming. He's carrying something in his cloak. And 637, the person stops several paces nearer. It's carrying what looks like a baby or a bundle of robes. Harry lowers his wand and glances at Cedric. Cedric glances back with a strange look. And the figure stops, we're told, beside a towering marble headstone six feet from them. So here's the figure, here's the headstone, and let's say here's Harry and Cedric. And from here to here, there's six feet of difference. Six feet separate them, okay? And then Harry's scar explodes with pain. And we hear a voice say, kill the spear. There's a swishing noise of Vada Kedavra and a blast of green light. He hears a heavy thud. And he opens his eyes and there's Cedric lying spread eagled on the ground beside him. Okay, so Cedric and Harry, so now Cedric is lying on the ground, so that's prone. Let me do it this way. So, Harry's standing. Cedric's lying on the ground next to Harry. And over, sorry, over here, still six feet away, is this figure in the tombstone. All right? So, here is Harry and Cedric. What happened when Cedric gets cursed? Boom. He just falls. He doesn't get blasted. He just falls to the ground. This is going to be important. Harry stares into Cedric's face and his open gray eyes, half open mouth. And then Harry is dragged to the tombstone. Okay. So Harry was here. Cedric was, you know, dead lying on the ground. So Cedric's here. Harry's here. And Harry gets dragged to the tombstone over here, six feet away, right? So Cedric is still lying on the ground. Harry's now not there anymore. So here's Cedric and here's Harry tied to the tombstone, six feet away. And on the tombstone is the name Tom Riddle. Cloakman is now conjuring cords tying Harry to the tombstone. And Harry realizes it's Wormtail. Wormtail checks the ropes, make sure they're tight. And then we're told, line of page 639, Cedric's body was lying some 20 feet away. How? The tombstone was only six feet from where Harry and Cedric were. Cedric died and we're told, Harry heard something heavy fall to the ground beside him. Cedric's body was lying some 20 feet away. The only way Harry's, Cedric's body could be 20 feet away was when Cedric died, he was moved 14 feet farther from Harry so that now Harry at the tombstone is 20 feet away. But that's not the description that happens. Why am I beating this horse dead? This is bad writing. It's even worse copy editing. A half decent copy editor should have been able to see. Six feet doesn't become 20 feet, right? Why is this, why is this significant though? It breaks the spell that rolling creates in creating the story. See, Tolkien in his essay on fairy stories says <clears throat> the mark, a mark of a good fairy story is that it obeys the laws within the world that is created. Right? The laws meaning it, it follows the logic in the world. Well, six feet doesn't become 20 feet. That, 
defies all logic. It it breaks the spell and makes you go, damn, why couldn't she have caught that? Why couldn't a copy editor have caught that? Well, one reason possibly, by the time this book was published, Bloomsbury realized, you know, she was the golden goose. Everything she wrote was dollar signs. So it's, I, I kind of think copy editor was told, don't change anything. An obvious misspelling, maybe, okay. Though there are misspellings, typos within the printed book. So Cedric's body was lying some 20 feet away. Some way beyond, beyond him, glinting in the starlight, lay the dry wizard cup. No, no. When Harry and, and Cedric touched the port key, they arrived at the cemetery and they were right there and the port key was right next to them. So they don't move at all. Wormtail comes. Uh, Voldemort kills... Um, Cedric, sorry, Wormtail kills Cedric with, you know, Voldemort's wand. He drops what is still right next to Harry and Cedric. The port key's still right there. But now suddenly, you know, you've got Harry over here. Cedric is now way over here. And the port key is even farther away. It, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Harry's wand was on the ground at Cedric's feet. Now, 20 feet away. But Harry, again, he hasn't been dragged 20 feet away. He's been dragged six feet away. It's just stupid. It's just stupid. So we see Wormtail do the you know, spell that brings back Voldemort. We see the baby thing put in the cauldron. Bone of the father unknowingly given, you will renew your son. And Tom Riddle's dust comes out. Flesh of the servant will willingly given, you will revive your master. Wormtail slices off your hand, his hand. Boom, boom, blood of the enemy forcibly taken, you will resurrect your foe. And we can go back to the opening chapter where Voldemort and Wormtail are having their discussion, and Wormtail suggests they can use somebody other than Harry Potter. Why? Because just about all witches and wizards are Voldemort's foes. But Voldemort has another reason for wanting Harry, which Wormtail doesn't know. Okay? So, Voldemort rises out of the cauldron. He asks to see Wormtail's arm, the other arm. He sees the dark mark and they start apparating around him and Voldemort starts monologuing, okay? 648 through 649, Wormtail, you know, is moaning, master, master, please, please. And Voldemort gives him a new hand. He gives him a silver metallic hand, okay? I kind of have a feeling he does this. Rowling has him do this because there is a Celtic myth that involves um, somebody losing a hand and it being replaced with a silver hand, okay? And I, I think she's drawing in that. There's also another set of novels written before this one was. Um, hold on just, just a second, let me make sure. Called The Silver Hand by Stephen R. Lawhead. It's in his Song of Albion trilogy.
Um, well, check that back. No, that's not the first. I can't find when it was first published. It was first, it was published by Thomas Nelson in 2006. I think it was actually published before then, though, by its original publisher. I'll have to check that. Um, so Voldemort starts talking to the Death Eaters. We get them addressed by name. 650, Malfoy. Lucius, my slippery friend, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. He goes on, he mentions others. The Lestranges should stand here, but they are entombed in Azkaban. You know, they will be freed. They will join me. McNair, <coughs> the head of the Committee for the Disposal of Magical Creatures. Okay. Crab, Goyle, you knew they'd be there, right? Okay. Not. Uh, and he says, bottom of 651. Here we have six missing Death Eaters, three dead in my service. One, too cowardly to return, he will pay. One who I believe has left me forever. So who's the one too cowardly to return and who is the one who has left me forever? He will be killed, of course. And one who remains my most faithful servant who has already re-entered my service. So, hold on a second. Um, so he goes on and talks about how Harry defeated him before, etc. Talks about the the paths he took to immortality. Page six fifty three. Talks about, you know, um, what happened four years ago, you know, with the Philosopher's Stone. And he does the Crucio curse on Harry. 657. 658, he tells um, Wormtail to give him back his wand, untie him. Why? He's going to prove to the Death Eaters that he's more powerful than Harry Potter, okay? So 659, you've been taught how to duel Harry Potter. When was Harry taught how to duel? Right, Chamber of Secrets. By whom? Lockhart. So no, he hasn't. So 660. We're told what Harry's thinking, top of the page. Okay. And Voldemort says, we bow to each other, Harry. Come on. Niceties must be observed. Dumbledore would like you to show manners. Harry bowed to death. And he forces Harry to bow. Okay. And now we duel. And he does the Cruciatus curse again. And Harry's, you know, excruciating pain. He stops it. 661. Little break. He says, you don't want me to do that again, do you? Harry doesn't answer. Answer me, Imperio. And Harry felt, this is the bottom of 661, for the third time in his life, the sensation that his mind had been wiped of all thought. Just answer no. Say no. Just answer no. See, what the Imperius curse does, is it takes away your will. In taking away your will, it takes away the sense of self. Right? But something in the back of Harry's head says, no, I won't. And he finally verbalizes, I won't. Voldemort gets angry at that, 662. And the Death Eaters notice aren't laughing now. Why? Well, seemingly, I think it's because nobody else has said no to Voldemort before. When he's tried to put an imperious curse on them. See, back when Moody was teaching them the unforgivable curses, we're told he put Harry through the Imperius curse, I think it is four times, and either on the fourth or fifth one, he was able to repel it. 
right? So Voldemort says, 6662, we're not playing hide and seek, Harry, because Harry hides behind a tombstone. You cannot hide from me. Does this mean you're tired of our duel? Does this mean you prefer me to finish it? Finish it? Come on, Harry, let's play. It'll be quick. It might even be painless. I would not know. I'd never die. Harry crouched behind the headstone, knew the end had come. There was no hope, no help to be had. And as he heard Voldemort draw nearer still, he could hear him walking closer. He knew one thing only, and it was beyond fear or reason. He was not going to die crouching here like a child, playing hide and seek. He was not going to die kneeling at Voldemort's feet. He was going to die upright like his father. He was <coughs> going to die trying to defend himself, even if no defense was possible. And we could jump from there to book six. When Harry has this realization, about death. Okay. And notice we're told here, before he has the realization, how is he not going to die? He's not going to die crouching. He's not going to die kneeling. He's not going to die begging. He's going to die upright. That is facing death. So Voldemort uses Avada Kedavra. And what does Harry use? Expelliarmus. Why? Harry wants to disarm Voldemort. Why doesn't Harry use Avada Kedavra? Well, Moody said, if you were to try to use Avada Kedavra, all of you, classroom, he said, I'd probably get no more than a nosebleed. Why? You have to really mean it. Does Harry really want to kill anyone? You know, he could say, um, jump to book six. No, <laughs> he doesn't. So Harry shoots his Expelliarmus. Voldemort shoots his Avada Kedavra, and the spells meet in the middle. Their wands connect by a gold shimmering light. It creates a web, a dome over them, right? The Death Eaters are shouting, they're looking for instruction from Voldemort, and suddenly there's an unearthly sound, 664, and Harry recognizes the sound. And it's Phoenix song, right? And he hears Dumbledore's voice in his ear, don't break the connection. Harry, I know, I know, right? So they get lifted up and moved, 665. There's these beads of light on the thread that's connecting the two wands. And Harry doesn't know why, but he knows he doesn't want the beads of light to come from Voldemort's wand to be pushed into Harry's. So he pushes them the other way. And we're told it connects. Harry pushes the beads into Voldemort's wand. His eyes widen in shock, and something comes out of the wand, hand, and then something else, Cedric Diggory. The thick gray ghost of Cedric Diggory, bottom of 665, wasn't a ghost. It looked so solid. And what, is, what happens? It, the ghost, whatever it is, says, Hold on, Harry. Okay. Voldemort's eyes are still shocked and wide. More screams of pain. Okay. Out comes Frank Bryce, leaning on his walking stick. He was a real wizard then. Killed me that one, did? You fight him, boy. Killed me. What does that mean? Past tense. The voice that says this is using past tense. That is, the voice is speaking, the voice is speaking present tense. You fight him, boy. That's like an imperative. It's like a command. 
Okay. Another body comes out, Bertha Jorkins. Don't let go now. Don't let him get you, Harry. Don't let go. How does Bertha Jorkins know who Harry is? Does she come out and Harry, you know, pull his bangs back? Okay. Another head comes out. His mother, your father's coming. Hold on for your father. It will be all right. Hold on. And then James comes out. And James addresses here, bottom of 667. When the connection is broken, we will linger for only moments, but we will give you time. You must get to the port key. It will return you to Hogwarts. Do you understand? So how does James know about the port key? How does he know about the connection? When all these things were in Voldemort's wand, did Cedric tell the others? Uh, Harry and I are in the Triwizard Tournament. We're tied. We touched the Triwizard Cup. It turned out to be a port key. Lord Voldemort never answered. Dumbledore later on is going to say, that what Harry saw are echoes of Cedric, Frank, Bertha, Lily, and James. The only problem with that theory is what does an echo do? Ooh, ooh, ooh. It merely repeats what was last said. Ed, ed. So how can these be echoes? Or is Dumbledore wrong? As he frequently tells us, he's been wrong before. Or is Dumbledore wrong? And what Harry is seeing are the same things Harry saw when he looked into the mirror of Aerosol. Are these the, so to speak, souls of these individuals? How else can you explain? that they are aware present tense of what is happening. James and Lily have been dead for how long? Harry's 14 now. They've been dead for 13 years. How can they be aware of the present? How can their echoes be aware of the present? Only if they are presently somehow aware, conscious, alive, okay? By the way, in the first edition of this book, in early printings, I don't know if it was just the first printing or not, Rowling had an error here on 667. Well, what in our, in our version is page 667. <clears throat> How are the things coming out of Voldemort's wand? The last curses performed come out first. So the very last curse performed was what? The hand, okay? It made the hand for Wormtail, so the hand comes out. Thing before that, Cedric's death, so Cedric comes out. Thing most recent before that, Frank Bryce, so Frank Bryce comes out. Thing most recent before that, Bertha Jorkins all the way back to Lily and James. Because if we go back to when Harry's parents were killed, which one was killed first? James was. Next one, Lily. Next one, Bertha Jorkins, you know, 13 years later. Next one, Frank Bryce. Next one, Cedric, okay? Well, in one of the early printings, she had James and Lily reversed. She had James come out first, right? And it was caught in subsequent printings. So if you have a copy with, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, this is true. If you have a copy <coughs> with one of the printings where James comes out before Lily, that's worth a bit more than just the buck 99 you can you know, get on Amazon and such. So, Harry says, yes, I understand, 668. And then Cedric says, Harry, take my body back, will you? Take my body back to my parents. Does that sound like an echo? 
it, it sounds like the soul, consciousness, awareness, saying, I am separated from the body that I should normally inhabit, but it's saying, take my body back. Why? So my parents have something to bury, so they get closure. And Harry says, I will. Notice, by the way, the bind that puts Harry. I mean, that's, that's asking a lot. Harry could say to Cedric, Cedric, we'll come back for it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of busy right now, okay? So they break the, the spell is broken. Harry goes back and Hans sees him, 671. There's Cornelius Fudge. Harry says, Voldemort's back. I saw him. Cedric Diggory is dead because Harry's got his body, okay? And Moody comes and gets him. Takes Harry up to the castle. 673. Harry tells him, cup was a port key. Voldemort came back. Killed Cedric, made a post, you know, Dark Lord's back, has a body, yes. Moody given a potion to drink. 675. They keep talking, and Moody says, um, Did Voldemort forgive them? What? I asked you whether he forgave the scum who never even went to look for him, those treacherous cowards who wouldn't even brave Azkaban for him, the faithless, worthless bits of filth who were brave enough to cavort masks at the Quidditch World Cup, but fled at the sight of the dark mark when I fired it. Harry's like, what? You fired him. I told you, Harry, if there's one thing I hate more than any other, it's a death eater who walked free. Moody told him that, okay? He says, I expected Voldemort to punish them. In other words, Malfoy, Crabbe and Goyle, McNair, all the others should have been crucioed. Well, who did get crucioed? Avery did, right? He admitted his guilt, et cetera, et cetera. You know. And Voldemort says, the you know, Dark Lord does not forgive, et cetera. Page 676, Moody keeps talking, says, man, it was hard to make sure you won the Triwizard Tournament. It hasn't been easy guiding through these tasks without arousing suspicion, you know. If you hadn't worked out the eggs clue, I had to give you, Harry, you didn't give me a clue. Cedric gave me the clue. And who told Cedric? I did. Decent people are so easy to manipulate, Potter. I knew Cedric could want to repay you for telling him about the dragons. He saw, remember, in the hallway when Harry stopped Cedric, you know, blew open his book bag and stuff. He saw Harry tell Cedric about the dragons. He knew Harry's a decent, honorable, let's use Harry's word, noble chap. So, he, you know, cornered him afterwards and said that was a decent thing you just did. He knew Cedric would do the same, all right? So he keeps talking and talks too long. 678, 679. Moody's getting ready to curse Harry and we hear stupefied. And there's Dumbledore. The door's blown open. And for the first moment, at that moment, Harry fully understood for the first time why people said Dumbledore was the only wizard Voldemort had ever feared. The look upon Dumbledore's face as he stared down at the unconscious one, the Mad Eye Moody, was more terrible than Harry could ever have imagined. No benign smile upon Dumbledore's face, no twinkle in the eyes. There was cold fury in every line of the ancient face, a sense of power radiated from Dumbledore as though he were giving off burning heat. <coughs> This is what I call Dumbledore uncloaked, you know. This is kind of the Dumbledore the white, all right? So Dumbledore takes Harry and he gives commands to a variety of people. 
Moody is revealed as not Moody. It's Marty Crouch Jr. Moody is in the locker. Okay. Um, Crouch gives all, you know, spills the beans under Snape's Veritas serum. Let's see here. And we get the truth revealed under Veritas serum. Find out, you know, how his father escaped. So go back to the previous novel for a moment. What was the prophecy that Trelawney gave tonight at midnight. The Dark Lord, the prisoner of the Dark Lord, will be unchained. Okay. Is did that refer to Peter Pettigrew, or did that refer to that night was when Barty Crouch Jr. overcame? the imperious curse that his father had him under. Okay. Remember, the year after Harry's parents' death, um, that's when Barty Crouch was sentenced to Azkaban. Right? He, couldn't, he couldn't deal with that. Snake uh, series told us about that. You know, Barty Crouch just came in, he cried and screamed, and then, you know, kind of gave up. Okay. Well, what do we find out? Barty Crouch Sr. brought his wife in, who took her son's place under disguise, apologies, Butchie, and he took his son out disguised as her, okay? And he kept him under apologies pushing for the next 12 years. 12 years later, we get the prophecy. He's been chained for 12 years. It was Barty Crouch Jr. that escapes, goes back to Voldemort and such, right? So, um, and sets into motion the plot that began at the beginning of you know this book. Um, Parting of the ways. Let's see. Book's full. Here we are, 15 minutes. So six ninety-four, six ninety-five. Harry's taken up to Dumbledore's office. Sirius reveals himself. And Dumbledore says, Harry, I need to know exactly what happened. Sirius is like, come on, Dumbledore, let, give it a rest. Let Harry get some sleep. And Dumbledore says, 695, if I thought I could help you by putting you into an enchanted sleep, allowing you to postpone the moment when you'd have to think about what happened tonight, I would. But I know better. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. Tell us what happened. So he does. Okay. Top of 696. Harry says, he said my blood would make him stronger than if he'd used someone else's. He said the protection, he'd have it too. The protection my mother gave me. And he was right. He could touch me. For a fleeting instant, Harry thought he saw a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. Now, we don't know what that means until much, much later. Book seven, much later. But it's at that point that Dumbledore knows, okay, now we have a shot. Now we have a shot at defeating Voldemort. And he knows what must happen, okay? So he talks about, you know, the, the images coming out of the wands. 697, Sirius says, Diggory, come back to life. That is Diggory resurrected. Dumbledore, no spell can reawaken the dead. A reverse echo, uh, an echo of the living Cedric would have emerged. Am I correct? And Harry says, yeah. 
the ghost Cedric, Dumbledore corrects him, Echo, which retains Cedric's appearance and character. All right. I still think Dumbledore's wrong. I mean, I think this is Dumbledore making an assumption. But as we will see in the remaining novels, not all of his assumptions are correct. Okay. So the Weasleys come in and Dumbledore gives, you know, orders and such. Fudge comes in as they hear Fudge screaming and Dumbledore asks McGonagall, what are you doing here? I gave you charge to watch over Crouch. And she says, there's no need to. Fudge has let the Dementors perform the Dementors kiss. Fudge says it's not a loss. He was responsible for several deaths. He was crazy. Dumbledore says Voldemort, Voldemort has returned. Voldemort was giving him instructions. Okay. Fudge can't believe it. Bottom of 705. Fudge alludes to Rita Skeeter's articles, Harry's crazy, et cetera, et cetera. Harry starts naming Death Eaters. Fudge says you could have gotten those from old news articles. 707. Dumbledore finally says to Fudge, if you accept the fact straight away that it's Voldemort has returned, take the necessary measures, we may still be able to save the situation. And so he starts giving a series of measures. Remove the Dementors from Azkaban. Fudge says, half of us only sleep well at night knowing the Dementors are there. Dumbledore says, the other half sleep less well at night. Why? Dementors are natural allies of Voldemort. Okay? Second, send an envoy to the Giants. Fudge, you got to be kidding me. Dumbledore is thinking, if we can get the Giants to side with us, that'll strengthen our hand. Okay? People hate them, Dumbledore. End of my career, page 708. You are blinded by the love of the office you hold, Cornelius. In other words, you're blinded by power. You place too much importance and always have done on the so-called purity of blood. You fail to recognize it matters not what someone is born, but what they grow to be. In other words, there's no such thing as bad blood. You can start off with bad blood and become good. It's our choices, Harry, Dumbledore says in book two, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. Our abilities are what we have from birth. Our choices are what we choose to do with them. Right? And he talks about Hardy Crouch, pure blood. And look what he chose to do with his life. Barty Crouch Jr. Right. Fudge says, I've given you plenty of leeway, 6709. But, you know, if you're going to work against me, Dumbledore, only one against whom I intend to work is Lord Voldemort. If you're against him, then we're on the same side. He can't be that Dumbledore. He can't be. Why? Why can't Fudge accept that? The entire world that's been built up over the last 13 years will do what? crumble and fall. Imagine for a moment if we were to get proof next week that Osama bin Laden is alive. He was supposedly killed in, what, 2010, 2009? What if we discovered he's alive? Then all the stuff about Obama going after, you know, the, it would all be a lie. What would they do for Democrats' chance of, you know, regaining, you know, continuing power? Gone. Or using another example, what if we were to discover, you know, Hitler didn't die in 1945 in Germany? What if we had incontrovertible proof Hitler died in 1988? in, you know, Jackson, Mississippi. And our government knew he was alive the entire time. What, what would that do? 
the whole edifice would, would collapse and crumble, okay? So Snape pulls out the ace, he goes up and he pulls his sleeve up and he shows the dark mark and says, 710, every Death Eater had the sign burned into him by the Dark Lord. It was a means of distinguishing one another, his means of summoning us to him. In other words, everyone is different. Snape is revealing this to Fudge, showing I was a Death Eater. Who else? It shows everybody else in that room. I was a Death Eater. Okay. He says, Karkaroff fled. Karkaroff was a Death Eater too. Fudge is like, I, I can't believe this. So Fudge leaves. He dumps the winnings on Harry's bed, okay, or on his bedside table. And Dumbledore starts, you know, setting things in order. So he tells, uh, Bill says he'll go to dad. He'll contact those at the ministry who will help, okay. He gives Madam Pomfrey some orders. He says it's time for two of our number to recognize each other for what they are. Page 712. Sirius, if you can resume your usual form, the big black dog transforms into Sirius Black. Snape is, you know, fit to be tied. And they shake hands. What does he mean to recognize each other for what they are? He means not only to recognize as each other, but as on the same side. As much as Sirius and Snape hate each other, they are on the same side. Molly is told, you know, by Ron, shut up. Sirius is cool. So he tells Sirius to go alert the old crowd, top of 713. Remus, Arabella Fig, Mundungus Fletcher, the old crowd. And then he tells Severus, you know what I must, what I must ask you to do. If you are ready, if you are prepared, Snape says I am. And good luck. What's Snape going to do? He has to go back to Voldemort. He has to prove to Voldemort he is still faithful to him. So we get the beginning, chapter 37. The beginning of what? The new war. What did Firenze tell Harry, tell Snape, um, Firenze and Bane tell Hagrid, book one in the Forbidden Forest? Mars is bright tonight. Why? War is coming. Well, this is the beginning. All right? So they have the end of year feast, and Dumbledore offers a toast to Cedric, 721. He tells them, I'm going to tell you something that ministry doesn't want you to know. Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. And by telling them the Ministry of Magic does not want you to know this, all their ears, you know, get really attentive. He also says there's somebody else who we must recognize tonight, Harry Potter, okay? How he escaped Voldemort, he risked his life to return Cedric, body, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, bottom of 723, every guest in this hall will be welcome back here at any time. I say to you all, once again, in the light of Lord Voldemort's return, we are only as strong as we are united as because we are divided. We can fight. Lord Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and hearts are open. If we have the same goal and if we're open-hearted, if we're not lock hearted, all right? So he says, remember Cedric, remember, if the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy, remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave. 
between what is right and what is easy. What would have been easy for Cedric to do? Take the cup. But Cedric did what was right. He took it with Harry. Notice what would have happened if Cedric had taken the cup. He still would have died. And they probably would have used Cedric's blood to bring Voldemort back. Voldemort wouldn't have gotten the protection he wanted, okay? But Cedric still would have died. All right? So, let's see here. Um, we'll stop there. So, I'll put up a quiz for the second half of Goblet of Fire. And today is Thursday. Tuesday, we will start Order of the Phoenix. I would say, see, I think I've got three days assigned, maybe four days. Have at least a fourth of it read. Try to have a third of it read. All right, we will stop there. I will um, save this and put it up on both D2L and the videos link later.